Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, it's been great being here. Uh, this is actually my last day here. Um, and I'd like to um, thank Steve for bringing me on board and doing a lot of the work with the organization. Um, and of course, everybody for all the, the interesting discussions. Um, I've been so distracted by all the interesting ideas floating around um, that I realized um, that I, I haven't tried to present a, a project that I've been working on. And um, this, so this is your chance, uh, hopefully towards the end of the talk and not at the beginning, to um, criticize this program, tell me that these calculations are not worth doing um, before I'm back in Amsterdam and my students are wasting their time on these calculations. Okay, so. Um, right. So the, um, for anyone who missed it, the, the firewall paradox is, uh, as I want to state it, it's a, it's a conflict between three principles that we like a lot, unitarity, the equivalence principle, and um, causality or um, locality. Um, and effective field theory implies uh, locality and causality. Um, and it also implies uh, the equivalence principle. At least we don't understand in effective field theory how you would, you would violate um, the equivalence principle. What I mean by the equivalence principle here is the statement that in a region of weakly curved space time, the quantum state is close to the Minkowski vacuum. Okay, so this is what's been called the, the no, no drama uh, hypothesis. Um, and if unitarity is preserved, then uh, we have a violation of one of these two other um, one of these two other principles. So we have some kind of violation of effective field theory in regions of low curvature and low energy density. Now, most of the discussion on this topic uh, focuses on trying to fix this problem in the global description of the black hole. And what I want to discuss today is a, is a more modest goal, which is trying to quantify this conflict uh, within one causal patch. Now, of course, uh, this is not a, a, a new idea. Um, black hole complementarity. Black hole complementarity did not answer every question relating to black hole evaporation. But what it did do is it, it gave us a simple criterion for when effective field theory is valid. It, it told us that effective field theory is valid as long as the energy density and curvature are far from the Planck scale. And we restrict to things that can be in principle measured in one, by a single observer. So we restrict to one causal patch. And black hole complementarity passed many non-trivial tests until the AMPS paper a couple of years ago. So what, what AMPS told us is that if we want to have unitarity in black hole evaporation, effective field theory has to be violated within a single causal patch, which within the causal patch of an, of an observer who falls into an old black hole. So this had several very important consequences. Um, one of them is that black hole complementarity, if unitarity is correct, then black hole complementarity must be wrong. We have to have a correction to effective field theory uh, in the infalling causal patch, so within a single causal patch, in a region of low curvature. And um, it's also creates a more general crisis because it leaves us without a criterion for when effective field theory is valid. And why should it be valid um, uh, when we describe inflation or in the, in the LHC? Yeah? I thought actually that the statement of when effective field theory breaks down is, is a bit more general than the way you summarize it. That there could be non-local invariants that do lead to super uh, quantities. And then questions that involve those on local invariants should also be outside of the framework of effective field theory. Well, that's right. So I, I guess this goes back to some um, early work by, by you guys uh, related to black holes. But in general, but if you have I, large, black, large boosts, yes. Right. But, but I think in a sense, those same large boosts would arise in inflation and so on. I mean, in any context where you have horizons, you have these large boosts. Um, so. Um, yeah, so, so right, I mean, going back to, uh, I guess, ever since Hawking's calculation, people were thinking about um, how, to, uh, how to modify effective field theory. And, and yeah, you, so you guys had some interesting proposals, and I, I think I haven't fully understood even everything that's in those old papers. Um, but I thought that even, even what people call then, then the 
a criterion for where simultaneous observations of, by two observers can be in conflict also in, invoke those kind of non local invariants rather than just saying, well, if you have a cause, it's not just a causal patch, it's, it's really observations that are highly boosted relative to each other. That's right. Okay, so, so, so we should discuss more. I, I still think that it is a, a fair statement to say that our current situation is that we don't have a simple criterion for when effective field theory is valid because it's not obvious, it's not clear when these effects are large, when they're small. Um, yes? Uh, if, you, if one is speaking of the original AMPS argument as opposed to the EMPSS argument, then isn't there a clear reason why effective field theory is not valid for that procedure, which is they're measuring an extremely high point correlator? I mean, in ADS, they would have well, to measure yeah, so, an so endpoint so correlator to do the original AMPS so experiment. But that doesn't mean effective expect. field theory is obviously Well, working. we don't expect that, that effective field theory works for endpoint correlators in ADS. Well, sometimes I mean, we do. It uh, okay, so, so, so well, I mean, I think we should defer this discussion, but, but it's certainly true that one possible, so AMPS is telling us we need at least some refinement of black hole complementarity. One refinement could be the one you mentioned about large boosts. One refinement could be about um, large point functions. Okay, I don't think there's a simple rule that tells us why you get a large correction to effective field theory for certain questions. Well, we see no, well, we see no correction to effective field theory in other situations like, like cosmology. Okay, and, and yeah, many of these ideas could, could be pushed in that direction, but I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think the question is resolved yet. I mean, you know, for example, locality violation. Right? If you can violate, when you, when you violate causality, you can send signals faster than the speed of light. Okay? And to a very good uh, um, accuracy, we see that we can't do that. All right? so, so then, uh, in what context can you do that? In what approximation? It's a, it's a dangerous... Uh... Yes? You keep uh, uh, putting uh, causality and locality on the same footing. I don't think that's fair. I think. But with Lorentz invariance, it's fair. No, no. In a, well, in a black hole background, yeah, so then the background breaks, Lorentz invariance, so then you can have non-locality in a particular frame. Yeah. Um, right. So a, a let, me con yeah. Let, let me continue to conflate them. Okay, I um, think it's right. And, uh, <laughs> well, effective field theory implies both locality Absolutely. and Absolutely. causality. Absolutely. All right, so, and, and that's, um, all right. So now, um, right. So what I, what I want to convince you of is that I, it's important to quantify the conflict between the three principles I mentioned at the beginning, uh, within one causal patch, uh, for two reasons. Well, one is the, the um, question of how large a violation of effective field theory within causal, a causal patch is required by unitarity. And what I want to try to tell you is that there seems to be at least some level of conspiracy that's hiding these effective field theory violations from any given observer. I'll give a couple of examples. And so that tells us that the causal patch story still has some role to play, I think, in, in uh, refining these, these paradoxes. It suggests that what we need is some kind of refinement of black hole complementarity. Um, and that the um, formulating these questions within one causal patch will still have an important role to play. All right, so um, obviously I'm not going to, I mean, a lot has been uh, written on this subject. I'm not going to be able to address every situation. But so let me give you a very simple cartoon of what sort of conspiracy I want I want to consider, um, and and this is a cartoon. Okay, so you're not allowed to attack me for this cartoon. All right, the, the, um, the I'll come to more well-defined questions in a second. So the cartoon is that maybe for an old black hole, some number of angular momentum modes uh, outside the black hole, you know, the, the Hawking modes that are actually going to radiate out, out to infinity. Those are entangled with the early radiation, as Amps has taught us. But local excitations near the horizon are still entangled from the outside point of view with the black hole and from the infalling point of view with their partners uh, behind the horizon. So in other words, the behind the horizon partners of the information carrying modes are not visible to any single infalling observer. All right, that, that's the type of conspiracy that I want to explore. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this in, in two particular examples, and I can, I'm going to show you how the causal patch does at least modify the arguments. You have another convention for AD and R. 
Well, <laughs> exactly. So there's some conventions around. So here I have the Hawking radiation. I have the early radiation outside. I have the Hawking mode that's coming out and its partner, P, behind the horizon. So um, I don't think I need to repeat this. So the, the equivalence principle said that these two should be in a pure state together. Unitarity tells us that H should be purified by some set of the outside radiation. Something that in this controversial subject everybody seems to agree on is that if this is a, a Hawking mode, then it should be entangled with something or other. It should not be in a pure state. Um, this is because it, we're considering frequencies of order the temperature. Um, and then effective field theory tells us that since these guys are space-like separated, they're independent systems. And so we can use strong subadditivity. And then we have a problem, of course, because this is supposed to be 0, this is supposed to be 0, and this is supposed to be 1. And that's not a negative number. So um, the first thing I want to tell you is that the simplest version of this argument does not fit within one causal patch. It kind of looks like it does. If I would go into this picture and I would draw some backward light cones, then you'd be able to fit all of these things inside the backward light cone of this observer here. But that's because I haven't drawn the angular direction. So, um, so the, the simplest example is that um, where, where this argument is strongest is when this, this Hawking mode is something that will escape to infinity. That's when unitarity gives a clear argument that, that it should be entangled with the early radiation. Now, the, the angular momentum barrier is much higher for high L mode. And so roughly H should be an S wave, or anyway, it should be some low L mode. Therefore, its partner P behind the horizon is also an S wave. It's also spread over the entire sphere. So now the question I, I want to ask is whether this mode P, once I think about the angular direction, can I fit a sphere behind the horizon within one causal patch? OK, so this is some. Uh, geometry question. Um, and I calculated this together with um, Robert Jefferson and um, Lawrence Kabir and Yisheng Yang. And what we found is that it doesn't fit. But, but you can detect an S wave particle. There's just a suppression uh, by looking at a wave stream region. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Okay, the, the simplest version was to say. We have an S wave outside. Um, we have an S wave inside. <coughs> and these two things together should be in a pure state. Now, it, it, it's true that you, you could modify the argument a little bit, and, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. But so let me talk about the geometry for, for a moment. So I'm just calculating um, the space-time geometry of a black hole. So the simple computation you can do is you can calculate the maximum angle that light can travel. Uh, behind the horizon before hitting the singularity. And that angle is finite, and it's equal to pi over d minus 3, where d is the space-time dimension. So in dimensions larger than 4, um, then you don't come close to measuring the entire sphere. And so you can't, strictly speaking, measure this mode p. On the other hand, you do measure a significant fraction of the sphere, say half of the sphere, in, in five dimensions. And so what you would need is you would need some kind of conspiracy to hide the information from the local modes um, while still, in some global sense, having this partner P behind the horizon that, um, that purifies the outside uh, Hawking mode. Or I'd rather say it differently. I really don't want to talk about uh, modes with de definite angular momentum behind the sphere because the rule uh, behind the horizon, um, because my rule is that I'm going to do effective field theory within one causal patch. So any mode that doesn't fit within one causal patch, I don't want to talk about. So, um, but, but indeed, to clarify in, the notation that in yeah. four dimensions it does fit or not. Ah, yeah. So the four-dimensional case is kind of marginal. So you can see stuff for the, from the entire sphere uh, just as as you hit the singularity. And I'm going to draw some more detailed pictures for the four-dimensional case in one in one second. So yeah, we might as well go to the four, to, uh, to the four-dimensional case because that, that's that's the case where it comes closest to fitting. So so um, there, since the, since the situation is marginal, then we need we need to describe the causal patch a little more carefully. 
All right, so the, the, um, these coordinates might look a little bit funny in the picture. These are just some um, Goldstrand pan Levé coordinates or some rain frame coordinates. They're, they're the natural coordinates for observers who start at rest at infinity and fall into the black hole. It doesn't matter too much what type of coordinates you use. You just need, you want to use some coordinates that are natural for the infalling observer. And this is one example of coordinates that are like that. And now what I want to ask, uh, what I want to ask about is, here's, the, here's some causal patch. And then I want to ask about the angular part of this picture, which is not drawn. On one of these time slices, to what extent can we measure the uh, relevant partner mode behind the horizon and also the, the Hawking mode outside the horizon. Okay, so, so you can see that there's um, a one parameter family of choices here. Say I'm going to fall in at this time, uh, then I could move around which causal patch I'm talking about, or equivalently you can fix the causal patch that you're talking about, and you can consider observers who fall in at different times. Your observer looks space-like on that diagram. Well, the, the, the observer isn't drawn. The observer is falling in like this. Um, the observer is falling in like this, orthogonal to these constant time slices. Oh. You should complain to Robert if you think the picture. <laughs> so, so now I'm just drawing on one of these time slices. All right, and a nice feature of these particular time slices, oh, which you explained to me, Ted, is that is that the intrinsic geometry is flat space. Okay, so, so all of these time slices, um, they run into the singularity at some point, so we're not, but we're not interested in the part of the time slice that's near r equals zero. We're just interested in the part near the horizon and trying to see um, this mode and its, and its partner. So, so here's a picture of what kind of thing you have. The, the red is the black hole horizon on this time slice. And the blue shaded region is the region that the infalling observer can see. Okay? So you can see in this case, the, the observer can see a little ways inside the horizon. He can see some fraction of the sphere. And he can see some piece of the outside. And, and something that's a little bit funny in this case is he can't see the stuff out near infinity. That's just because that you can see on this picture. If you take this particular time slice here, for example, the backward light cone here we can only see two directions, but it intersects here, and it intersects here. So we're missing the part near infinity. You can adjust that by looking at an earlier time slice. So this is not a big success so far, because we can't see very much of the sphere. So let's consider some different time slices, so we can try to see more of the angular direction. OK, so again, this red circle is the horizon. And this blue shaded region is what you can see. So it's getting a little bit bigger in angle. And what you can see is that as you increase the angle, there's a trade-off here. As you increase the angular, angular scale that you can see, you start to lose the interior of the black hole. Okay? What's happening here is that your horizon is, um, you're, you're looking back at an earlier and earlier time slice relative to this uh, observer. and the, the horizon for this guy who falls in looks, a little, looks more or less like the black hole horizon for a while. Okay? So now he can see a nice big region outside, and he can see most of the angle, um, but at a cost of not being able to see very far inside the black hole. Um, so if you, if you go a little bit farther, then the region you can see looks like this. So, so what, what you can see here, these are just two different... Um, time differences. Uh, what you can see is there's a certain distance here that you can see inside, which is rather small compared to the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, and there's an amount of angle that you, can, that you can see. And you can calculate how those things are related. Um, if you call uh, H, the, so again here, so now we have like a, a cartoon. The red is still the black hole horizon. And the blue is the region that's invisible to this observer. Okay, so he's missing a little region outside the horizon on the side opposite to where he falls in. He's missing an angle, um, which is related to that distance by the square root. And then he can see a distance inside, which is not very large, which is also given by this square root. Okay, so this is the relevant picture. If you want to think about which 
interior modes are accessible to uh, an infalling observer. Okay, so now now you can come back to the question and and. Keep in mind, this H is something that you can dial, okay? So you, you can pick it to be whatever it wants, whatever you want it to be, by picking the uh, relative time between the, um, what you're dialing here is basically the relative time between the causal patch and the infalling observer whose physics you're describing. Um, right, so now you can ask, what kind of conspiracy would be needed so that, so you can see again, you can't see the whole S way, but you can see most of it, okay? Um, so you're missing some part of this partner mode, um, but to evade the firewall conflict, completely evade it, the black hole would have to hide this secret. So the secret is basically, there's information in this outgoing mode. So there's information in, in the partner mode. And that information is the thing that's in danger of making the, the firewall. It's in conflict with, with the near horizon region being in a pure state. And so the black hole has to hide the secret in such a way that even seeing most of the interior sphere is not sufficient to learn the secret. Now that's something you can do in quantum secret sharing, but it's not really clear, and, and that's one thing that, that I want to think about, it's not really clear whether this is consistent with our usual picture of effective field theory in states near the vacuum, okay? So at the level of qubits, you can do this, you can have a system. Um, so a simple thing you can, you, can, you can figure out here is that um, if you think of um, tiling the Rindler region with one qubit per, um, per thermal wavelength, you'll see that you're always missing at least one qubit. In fact, a relatively large number of qubits, but not a large fraction of the qubits, okay? So at the level of qubits, you can, you can encode a quantum secret in such a way that um, you need to learn the secret. Um, but here we have some other requirements. We want effective field theory to be valid in this entire patch outside. Um, and so I think it's not completely clear the, the, the level of, of conflict that you would have. I'm, actually, I'm, I'm not sure that you can actually have something where you know nothing about the secret if you're missing just one qubit. I mean, as long as the message I think that's allowed. Well, I mean, so you, you can do something silly, like you can just put the message in the last qubit, but I mean... No, no, any, uh, no, where you need all of them. I, th I think that's the rule. We, we can look back at the, yeah, let's look at the quantum, quantum secret paper, 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 but, uh, but I, I think that's the... Yeah. Um, usually, there's people who are more experts than Usually, once you have a little more than half, then you have everything. Uh, well, that's with some assumption about random states or something like that. No, way. All right, we can look at the paper, but I, I looked at this carefully before we wrote our paper, and, and the, at least in the standard quantum secret sharing of uh, Gottesman and... Uh, Cleve and Lowe. And? Cleve and Lowe. Cleve and Lowe, yeah. They, they, they say that you can, you can hide it in such a way that you need, for example, you need all of the qubits before you know the message. Okay, and with n minus one. Is about random states a good one here? Yeah, that's right. So that, that's that's why I think there's still some. That's why I'm saying that the fact that you can do this in quantum secret sharing doesn't yet prove that that everything is fine. I don't think that's the situation. It's just telling you that, um, you know, this this argument this argument does not quite fit. I guess we can't measure I p. I think that you need it to be mixed state scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can we can. Um, yeah. We can so leave inside the, the secret sharing, even if it was correct that you did do this, this would just suggest that in a set of states, in a small fraction of states, you don't see a firewall. Is that correct? I mean, if, the, if this message is hidden in a small set of qubits, then it would suggest that for some states you don't see a firewall, but for others you do. Or for most states. Um, <laughs> those states might not be for well, all states. Yeah, let's, 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 let's come to that. All right, so I want to come to, to one more example. Of, of where the, the causal patch um, plays a role. So the, the first example was this original um, AMPS argument. And, and I'll, I'll mention at the end, you know, some modifications of that setup that will worsen the, that, that will make uh, things more uncomfortable for this infalling guy, potentially lead to larger effective field theory violations. So, so my second example is, is the very recent argument of Joe and Don that appeared uh, last week, I guess. 
Uh, and Don men talked about that a couple of days ago. So basically, the ingredients there are you're considering an ADS black hole. And then we consider some mode outside the horizon that has uh, definite angular momentum. And then they want to choose the radial profile of this mode so that it has a fairly definite Schwarzschild frequency. Uh, its frequency is less than or of order of temperature. And this mode is localized away from the horizon, but it's in the near horizon zone. And then they construct this operator, this unitary transformation, that's constructed uh, from the number operator of that mode. And they act on a black hole state. And then they very quickly show that, um, that you get into trouble. So um, bulk effective field theory tells you that this unitary operator doesn't commute with the number operator for the infalling modes. And so um, when, if you start out in a state with no excitations in the infalling modes, acting with this U operator will put you in a state where there are excitations in the, in the infalling modes. And then they do some state counting to argue that the generic state has significant overlap with these states of the form U acting on the black hole. OK, so, so this is an argument that um, generic black hole states will have some excitations near the horizon, will have some degree of, of firewall. So unless you violate effective field theory, then the typical black hole state is going to have a firewall. So the question is, do these causal patch considerations do anything to save us from this argument. And um, the, the possible loophole is whether this operator u, measuring this exterior mode with definite angular momentum, and the number operator for the infalling mode actually fit within one causal patch. Okay. In other words, if I impose the rule that I'm al only allowed to use effective field theory within one causal patch, would that allow me to escape from this argument? So. I haven't had a chance to really calculate this yet. But my speculation uh, is that the causal patch of ADS black holes can't actually contain both operators. And I can draw you a picture for what I think it looks like. But I was too distracted by interesting conversations to actually do this calculation yet. And well, the paper came out pretty recently. So let's take the black hole horizon there. Uh, and then the. In the, and let's consider an ADS black hole with the Schwarzschild radius about equal to the ADS radius. Okay, I don't think the situation is going to get better for large black holes. In that situation, what this infalling uh, causal patch contains, um, I think the horizon for the infalling causal patch looks something like this. So there's a certain distance d away from the horizon that, again, you can dial by the time that you fall in relative to the time slice that you're looking on. And I think what's going to happen is that the region that you can't see as the infalling observer is going to be this region here. OK? So then the exterior modes with definite angular momentum that you can construct uh, are going to have to start uh, a distance d outside, where d is something you chose by choosing your causal patch. And now these modes have to have de relatively definite um, wavelength. They have to have a relatively definite Schwarzschild frequency. And so what that means is they look like this. They start out with having a wavelength um, of order d, let's say. That makes them the thermal scale. And then they have to be, they have to expand in this kind of uh, exponential way. And you need a few nodes in order for it to be um, relatively well localized in frequency. So this diagram is a little unfair. This will still fit in the near horizon region. Okay? It's just that it will fit in a region that's uh, large compared to D. Okay, and, and it will be it's a mode with definite angular momentum, so it's spread over the over the sphere here. Can we localize it in the angular momentum? Can we smear it a little angular momentum? I'll come to that. They made their argument very carefully with modes with even low angular momentum relative to the ADS scale, okay, or, or of order the ADS scale. Uh, and I appreciated that conservatism in their paper. Um, all right. So now, uh, what, what is this, this number operator from some, for, for some infalling mode? Well, it's some operator, um, some local thing where you can measure a mode and its partner here. 
right? Now the place, the issue, um, right. So now the point is, in order to fit this this mode in your causal patch, and to have the other properties that you wanted it to have, then it needed to be at least this distance d away. Whereas the types of um, infolding modes you can measure, you can't make your partner a prop, you can't make these modes of any of wavelength any shorter than, sorry, a, any um, longer than d. Otherwise, you won't. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to measure because you can only, only see a little ways into the black hole. But then you can see you don't really have a problem because this mode and its partner are localized on scales. That entanglement is on scales less than d, uh, and so that entanglement. This, this number operator will actually commute with this because there's space like, it will actually commute with u. So here's your big u out here. Here's your number operator for the infalling mode. And those operators will actually commute because they're space like separated. All right, so I haven't, let me emphasize, I've not really done this calculation yet. Um, but I, I think there's at least an, an interesting question here. Um, and it's another hint that um, that the causal patch is, is an important, the, the causal patch constraint on when you can use effective field theory, it gives an important modification to these types of arguments. So um, a, an additional open question here is that a mode with definite angular momentum, especially with low angular momentum, relative to the ADS scale, we can cleanly map those to CFT operators. And I don't think we understand yet what's the right physics interpretation for the modes that are localized in angle. Um, we have a formal uh, smearing function um, that, that allows us to write it in terms of CFT operators that involves modes at arbitrarily high angular momentum. We don't expect those modes to be excited in typical states. So it's not, I, I think we, we um, yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot and I don't think we understand yet what, what is the right interpretation of these sorts of operators. I think uh, Joe and Don avoided them in their argument precisely because of these technicalities. But um, it would be very helpful to understand. You know, these are just modes outside the horizon that are localized in angle. They don't have to be that localized. Right? This is something that we should be able to understand in ADS-CFT. But I think there's a missing ingredient there in, in that. You um, need to take arbitrary. You don't need to actually make them compactly supported, right? I mean, you just want to sort of have most of their support be. <laughs> right? So well, you could do that. Do that with a hundred L's or something, right? Uh, you know, this whole conspiracy theory involves encoding modes and in certain angular information, certain angular momentum modes. That's not going to disrupt the local entanglement too much. Okay, so then I can't let you be casual about like, well, it doesn't have to be really compact support. And, and this ADS construction cares a lot about whether it's compact support, right? If you have an operator with compact support, then there's no smearing function. There's no spatial smearing function. And if you just let it be a Gaussian, then there will be a spatial smearing function. Of course, that spatial smearing function will depend. It'll be UV sensitive in the sense that, you know, the exact Gaussian that you pick will be reflected in what the boundary operator is. So some of the boundary, the, the, CFT, the ADS CFT dictionary for these types of modes seems to be UV sensitive in a way that the conventional um, dictionary is not. All right, so the, the, the takeaway message is, is simple. It's that there are some hints that the causal patch still has some role to play, basically in censoring violations of, of uh, the laws of physics, you know, of the conflict between unitarity and, and effective field theory. And um, characterizing this, this tension, I think, is important for um, understanding how, how big the violations of effective field theory have to be in the causal patch. And, you know, the other point is, once we have uh, an in a violation within the causal patch, then that's observable in principle, and, and we should start thinking about how we could observe it. So there, there's obviously a lot of open questions. One thing that I don't really know how to calculate that I would like to think about is how to think about the role of the transmission coefficient, you know, the probability of the mode uh, going through the barrier. Um, this basically comes in at the very beginning when you want to say that this mode outside uh, has to be purified by the early radi radiation. It seems pretty clear that that statement um, doesn't have to be the case for a mode that's very unlikely to transmit through the barrier. 
and, and uh, in fact, I don't think anyone claimed that it is the case. But I don't think we have a quantitative understanding, really, uh, as you dial the probability of this mode escaping through the barrier, of how this formula uh, gets modified. Or maybe that's not even the right formula to write. But how, does the, how do these uh, arguments get modified as you dial the transmission coefficient? You know, for the very high L modes, they're very unlikely to, to escape. And so we think we don't have to worry about them being um, entangled with the early radiation. From the, well, OK. So uh, a second question is to um, characterize more carefully the entanglement of localized modes in the Minkowski vacuum. You know, we understand how the Riller modes are entangled. And, um, but what we really want to use in these arguments are localized modes. I've looked into this a little bit with a master's student, and, and honestly, I think I'm coming to the conclusion that uh, the cartoon picture that everyone uses is pretty much correct. And uh, it'll be nice to have some formulas for how these uh, localized modes are entangled. But uh, I, I think the physics in this case is not um, surprising. Um, in, in other words, you can take Rindler modes and you can make wave packets out of them, and they're entangled with their, their partners. In a, in the way you would guess. Um, although I, that the, the paper, it, there's, there's not a paper in the literature that I've been able to find that, that explains that, that calculates that. Um, right, of course, I've been emphasizing we want to know how severe can the conflict be within one causal patch, and can we invent some kind of a simple rule for effective field theory violation uh, within the causal patch? Um, OK, two more uh, quick random things. So a fun uh, idea, if the firewall picture is correct, which I'm sure other people have thought about as well, is that uh, in that case, you could understand, in that case, you, it really would make sense to think about the field theory degrees of freedom as part of the microstate of the black hole. And um, you know, obviously, uh, you would have to take the UV cutoff of your field theory large in order for the field theory modes to be a significant fraction of the energy. But in this way of thinking with the generalized entropy, that's something that we think uh, makes sense. Um, probably some people here have even written about this idea. I don't know. But uh, that, that's a nice thing that could, that could come out. And, and it would kind of explain why you know, the cases where we know how to count microstates are, are always extremal black holes. And those things are zero temperature. And so at least vaguely, the quantum field theory outside the horizon is not contributing to the entropy because those modes are not excited. Um, and then finally, this is just kind of a list of situations where the, um, the causal patch seems to save you from a, a sharp version of the conflict in cases where uh, it seems like you would need something, something else. Um, so, the, so, so the two main cases where it seems clear that you would need some other escape or, or you would need to say that there's, or the other cases where you would seem to need some effective field theory violation are, are three-dimensional IDS black holes and um, mine black holes. Um, in the case of black hole mining, um, Adam Brown pointed out some, in principle, obstructions to the efficiency of mining. It doesn't prevent you from mining, but it means that the, the, um, the radiation coming out through these mining strings always has to tunnel. And, um, so it comes back to this question of quantifying the role of the, the transmission coefficient. So I certainly don't understand everything about this. Um, I'm not claiming that if, you would have, if we would just restrict to one causal patch, we would have no problem. But uh, it is remarkable how restricting to one causal patch weakens some of the conflicts with effective field theory. All right, thanks. When you say mine, do you mean threaded? Because I mean, I, I say threaded, yeah. mining is kind of this active operation of dropping a bunch. But yeah, if you consider yeah. a threaded black hole, yeah. then, it's, then then everything comes out in one dimension, and this this causal patch of problems evaded. You said something about yeah. tunneling, but I think I think the barrier penetration factor is comparable to that for the S wave. So yeah, I think I think that in principle, if you saturate all the inequalities, then yeah, indeed, you have a uh, transmission probability of order a half. That the only the only rule is that the um, basically the string is going to melt when 
its width is equal to the local Hawking temperature. Melt and, in what and, sense? I mean, it's just, uh, well, the string has a tension. So, and, and from the outside point of view, so from the infalling point of view, the string is just there. Um, from the outside point of view, at some point, the, the string gets into a region that's too hot for it to. Well, now you're talking about the frame of someone who's hovering, but that never appears in the discussion. Well, I, I, look, I, I think, I mean, um, no, no, this, is, this is not a string which has a bottom, which would have that issue. It's a string which actually, it just, it just, it just, you know, uniformly penetrates the horizon. So there's, it doesn't, it doesn't melt. Well, uh, okay, maybe we should discuss this in more detail. This is what Adam explains in, the, in his paper that from the, from at least in the outside description, when, when, um, when the, when the uh, tension of the string is equal to the lo local Hawking wavelength, then, um, right, because, because how, when, when it's, you can also use the infalling picture, but either way you're going to come to the same conclusion that there's some order one tunneling factor there. Um, uh, you know, another question is what, what, um, yeah, whether you could understand the, um, the effect of these strings. You know, certainly these, these strings, um, change the quantum state for the ingoing modes. I mean, that's that's their job, right? They're they're absorbing these modes that otherwise would have been reflected by the barrier. Um, so so they have an interesting effect on the quantum state. But um, yeah, I, I agree. So so strings are certainly one um, one way that you can that it appears that you can get more um, a stronger violation of effective field theory within one causal patch and. Um, yeah, there's some details there that I would like to understand better. By the way, you probably aren't one of these people who immediately goes and sees the cited in the paper, but we actually, yeah, we talked about, exactly, we did talk about the paper. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> right, maybe sort of slightly philosophical point, but I never understood anything really about black hole complementarity because I didn't understand why I should care about the causal patch, you know, observable to one world line. I mean, quantum field theory is about fields. It's not about world lines and observers that are located at one place. But, but am I missing something that's sort of a, a different way to say, it, say what you're saying? Like, why is it important or a critical distinction whether or not... Um, Measurements located on one world line could simultaneously, you know, could collect. No, it's not. It's not that the measurements should be located on one world line. I mean, suppose that you could resolve the firewall problem by having some non-locality, but that non-locality was always just connecting points that right. are causally separated from each other, right. right? Then, then that would be an, in principle, unobservable violation of, of locality. Right? I mean, that, first of all, that's something you can do in field theory. Um, and second of all, that's not something you could go in the lab and now start trying to send signals faster than the speed of light to the moon, um, because this violation of, of locality would be, you know, only um, only at points that we'll never be able to to communicate. Yeah. So I I'm just saying. I, I'm not saying that. The criterion, you're still saying the criterion is that one person at one point has to have all the information for it to be a contradiction. Or something. No, just if there's some lo if there's some non-locality, so something gets gets say something gets quantum xeroxed, okay, and 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 uh, uh, some information that was here appears over here. Um, then there's a question of whether the whether Alice and Bob will be able to get together in the future and and figure out that this quantum xeroxing occurred. Okay. Right, so again, it comes. Why do they have to get together? I mean, the question is why. By getting together, you mean in a sense Alice has to send her information, let's say, to Bob, so he yeah. is in possession of the contradictory information. Yeah. Why does it matter if a point is in possession? I mean, it's just not what field theory well, is about. But this, this, was a per this is like saying that um, you know, it, what does it matter that you can't measure both the position and the momentum of the particle? I know that it has a position. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this was a new, a new attempt to insert positivism or instrumentalism as a proposal for how to resolve the problem. 
to insert, you know, those but, I mean, it was, it physics. It was inspired and, by the correct argument that I just gave. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, not right, every, not every such argument is necessarily going to uh, That's right. That's to the right, right place. But, and, but it could. You know. So, but then you need a formalism that, that, that accommodates for this lack of, you know, you need quantum mechanics after that that accommodates yeah. for this. So, so, yeah. so yeah. I, I mean, agree. yeah. So one needs a formalism that supersedes field theory, that formulates field theory in, in, in causal patches. I mean, one could imagine a formalism that supersedes conventional field theory, I guess. It, it, would that be fair? I mean, if you no, really well, want to see... Well, no, I mean, uh, uh, look, from a practical point of view, then, then, yeah, if you want to have the global picture, yes, you would need something that supersedes field theory. If you just want to have the picture in one causal patch, you just use field theory. Well, no, except you need to explain that information isn't lost, right? So, I mean, if you believe in information loss, then you can take the point of view that you're advocating. But, I mean, if you if you think it's information is not lost, then purely quantum field theory is wrong. And so now we should think about what's right. But, can, can I? Yeah. So it's slightly unrelated complementarity also seems, maybe also philosophical, it seems to take a locality extremely seriously. But if you don't have, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you're, in, if you're in ADSCFT and, and, and you don't even have a notion of a background metric for some quantities that may be non-perturbative, why should locality be taken so seriously? I mean, if, for example, there's another saddle point in which the causal connection of points is totally different, then, then, then you don't I mean, even have a notion I of I mean, I, I think you're essentially asking the question, why shouldn't there be violations of locality within one causal patch? But I don't even know and why and my answer to that is uh, clearly there should be. Okay, the the thing about about the causal patch is it was a simple idea and it worked very well. It passed many non-trivial tests. Okay, and it still seems to have some role to play here. That, that makes you. Um, but but yeah, certainly. Why should there be zero non-locality within one causal patch? I think ADSCFT strongly suggests that that's not the situation. Well, I don't think that was ever really advocated, right? I mean, the, the claim was that there wouldn't be sort of order one. Yeah. Uh, no. Effective field theory isn't really well, well defined. Whether, really whether, whether or not that was advocated, let, let's let's take that as a reasonable claim that the, the times when when this this exponentially small non-locality would conspire to give order one yeah. uh, commutators would not occur in the causal right. patch. Yeah. All right. Now, now we we probably need some refinement of that statement, but. Uh, Other comments or questions? Okay, thanks again.